This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation about what's the matter with literary academia and how to fix it with Jonathan Gottschall, English instructor at Washington and Jefferson College, author of Literature, Science, and a New Humanities. Jonathan Gottschall is an English instructor at Washington and Jefferson College. In his new book, Literature, Science, and a New Humanities, he defines what's at a very basic level wrong with modern literary scholarship and describes an alternative that may point the way forward. Jonathan, welcome to the program. Thank you. You start the book with what seems to me, residing as I do outside the academic literary establishment, as a fairly serious indictment of the of really the entire endeavor at this point, that uh, literary studies has lost the way to create, or rather not create, but to produce, to discover new reliable knowledge. What does that exactly mean to someone who's not involved in this world? Well, if you think of the purpose of a discipline, the, 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 the bottom dollar sort of raison d'etre of a academic discipline, there can be different arguments about what... A discipline is supposed to do. My argument is that the most fundamental purpose of a scholar or scientist is to produce new, more reliable, more durable contributions to our understandings of the subject matter. Um, and you are right. My my fundamental problem. With the field of literary studies, as it has been, as it has been practiced over the last few decades, is that it's sort of failed in that most fundamental task of accumulating more reliable, more durable understandings. We very rarely, in our field, uh, figure things out. How long has this been the case? Has it? Is it really just a, a phenomenon of the last few decades, or has this been an eternal problem with literary studies? It's probably, to some extent, been an, an eternal problem. Many, many people would respond to my critique by saying, well, of course not. Literary studies is not an accumulative field. It is, it, it's a bad idea to judge it by the standards of the sciences. Um, so there, there is real truth to the fact that, you know, you can't look back to some golden age of literary scholarship when you know knowledge uh, was piling up and it was good, clean, uh, reliable, durable stuff. Uh, on the other hand, literary scholars, most of them, do style themselves as seeking out uh, more reliable, more durable, truer understanding of the phenomena they investigate. And I think it's pretty easy to illustrate, and I spend, you know, the first part of the book at least trying to illustrate that, that we haven't done a very good job of it um, in recent years. And there's very clear reasons for that. It's not mysterious why we haven't. These are problems that can be addressed and, and uh, fixed. And so what you're saying is the existing literary studies, literary theory establishment claims to be searching for reliable knowledge, but they're just kind of not doing it at the same time? Yeah, I mean... You can think of, a, of, any, of any sort of scholarly or scientific endeavor as being based upon sort of simple foundations. There'll be theoretical foundations, theories that guide the investigators. There'll be methods um, that, are, that are used to see whether or not the theory-guided ideas are true. And there'll be governing attitudes and that, that sort of... Uh, structure the whole endeavor. Uh, my argument in the book is that the field is sort of systematically using bad theories, uh, then going and investigating those theories with, with weak methods, inadequate methods, and it's all been, being uh, guided and structured by attitudes that lead us systematically into error. So what are these attitudes, and where did they come from? How did it come to this, I guess, is the core of what I'm asking. Well, the, attitudinally, I think there's, there's, there's two major uh, strands to it, in my view. One is the idea, and this is a new idea over the last several decades, that instead of the scholar's duty being to try to be as objective as possible, so Matthew Arnold said that, 
a literary critic, his first job, or her first job, is to pursue disinterested inquiry. The idea is that your political beliefs should not color, much less determine, your fact claims. And over the last several decades, people have turned 180 degrees away from that wisdom and have embraced the view that there are no ideologically disinterested positions anyway. And so not only uh, is it futile to try to be objective, it's, you know, in some ways it's, it's uh, playing into the hands of, you know, of the, power, of the status quo, the powers, the powers that be. Um, so, so, so one is an embrace of ideology and the, uh, uh, the idea that scholarship can be a vehicle for political beliefs or for political action. The problem with that is obviously that the, the mandates of good scholarship can often be at, at odds with the mandates of the political uh, goals. That idea, that, that, that politically activist scholarship, has been wedded together with something that's come out of postmodernism or post-structuralism over the last few decades, this idea that knowledge is impossible, that, is, that uh, it really is impossible to do the thing that I am suggesting, which is to come up with knowledge that can, in any objective sense, be called truer or more reliable uh, than what came before. How does this sort of thing then sustain itself as an academic discipline, saying that knowledge is impossible and moving forward in an arena in academia, a place that an outsider would think of as as a, a walled city where knowledge is what is the product? How do literary studies as they currently exist, how does it justify its own existence then? Well, I think you're right to identify a basic irreconcilable problem that people are saying that knowledge is impossible. Uh, but, you know, critics of post-structuralism have pointed out, um, you know, why should I take, how, you know, how, if you say knowledge is impossible, um, how can I take your word for it that it's impossible? You know, isn't that a fact claim? Isn't that a truth claim? Of course it is. The discipline is sort of stumbled along, fettered by that, those ideas. But I, but I think in, in recent years, uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is a condition that's characterized literary studies over like three or four decades. So I'm making a generalization. I think in recent years, those sort of really uh, strident claims, you know, coming out of deconstructionism and so on, that you know, there's, there's just no way to, to, to claim something is truer than what came before. I think, I think those really sort of strident uh, arguments have, have softened. Your book centers so much around what the humanities have to take or can profit from taking from the methods and the attitudes of sciences, both natural and and social. What's the main thing that they can stand to gain if they adopt from the other okay. parts of yeah, the library? Yeah, that's the tower? core of the book. The, the idea is, you know, you know, part of what I have to do if I want to, you know, change the way things are done in my field is I have to point out, where things are lacking. So the critique of the book is that I think the theories are not very good and the attitudes are not very good and the methods are not very good. Then the challenge then becomes to say, what should the replacement be? And so the argument of the book is you know, pretty radical. It's, it's that there's already a very good model in place for developing more reliable understandings of phenomena. And the model is in science. And the argument is that it's in, insofar as is possible, literary scholars and other humanists should model their inquiries upon scientific models. It doesn't mean, you know, dressing up in lab coats and aping scientists in the really most, you know, servile and pathetic sort of way, but just realizing that coming to a recognition that there's not some sort of wall separating the sort of work that humanists do from the sort of work that scientists do. And many of the tools that scientists use good effect uh, can be put to use by us as well. It seems that there's a, the first ob- obstacle that I can identify from having read your book and from talking to you so far is that you would first have to get professors, for example, who would claim that 
the true false distinction is not particularly important. They'd have to admit that, in fact, it is important what's true and what's false. That seems like a fairly tall order. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the, in, in the book I say, you know, that this is a call for upheaval. The book is a call for upheaval, for paradigm shift. It really is a, you know, it may be misguided, but it is a call for a sort of revolution in the field. And um, the odds are that in any revolution, uh, the revolutionary ends up dead in the street. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an awfully good chance of, of uh, the resistance to my ideas, whether my ideas are good or not, uh, being so strong, they don't ever go anywhere. Um, so one of the problems is what you talked about. There's an attitudinal issue. Um, there's the fact that most people in the field, you know, who would be confronting my ideas are, are vested in the old system. You know, they have a whole CV, a whole resume filled up with papers written in the old system. They would have to repudiate a lot of that. And there's the fact that they're not trained very well in sciences. They don't, they don't understand uh, very well what science is. They, and they certainly don't have the sort of methodological toolkit, you know, the understanding of statistics and probability that are required to, to actually do science. And that's part of what my, my argument is, that literary scholars shouldn't only be borrowing from the sciences, which literary scholars have done all along, but they should, where possible, uh, do science. They should uh, borrow the methods from the sciences as well. Let's talk a little bit about the actual methodological differences between the humanities and the sciences, or specifically this sector of the humanities and, say, natural science. Now, one of the starkest contrasts you set up in the book is that whereas a natural scientist will need to look for all confirming evidence they can as well as all disconfirming evidence, uh, what it seems to be the case in the humanities is that essentially you're just looking for only confirming evidence. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's the major methodological barrier to the accumulation of knowledge in the humanities. It's why, to a large extent, things in the field are a disaster. It, I mean, it's a truism to say that the, the, field of the, humanity, the fields of the humanities are in crisis in, in literary studies specifically. And I, I think that the, the idea you just identified, that what literary scholars do is go and hunt and peck around through texts for evidence that confirms their idea, no matter how far out their idea is, is the problem. And the problem is that if you do that, you will find evidence for your idea, no matter how weak your idea is. I say in the book, the problem with literary methodology is it's never wrong. It's almost impo- you have to, no determined literary critic has ever failed to find evidence for, for his preferred idea. So that's a huge problem. If, if nothing can be wrong in the field, then nothing can be right. And it would seem that if somebody is publishing, say, a paper using this method of evidence gathering where they're only paying attention to what confirms their hypothesis, it would seem to me that then they're very easily refuted or shot down afterward because someone else can just come along and look at only the disconfirming evidence toward the original paper. And it just kind of of goes around and around. Round and round and round. It's exactly the image I use in the book. that You end up with a field just chasing its tail. All you have is our argument and counter-argument going on uh, forever. And, and, you know, when I was in uh, graduate school, uh, and I realized that this was sort of the status of the field, um, uh, it was intensely disappointing to me and uh, discouraging. Um, and so I, I, I started looking for a way out of that sort of vicious, endless spiral. Now, is this practice defended, as we said earlier, with that same rationale that there really isn't there really isn't any truth or falsity to be had in literary study, or is there is there some other angle people come at where they say, well, this is actually a good method for this type of subject matter, for this object of study? I think it might be a combination of the two. There's certainly this feeling that that is very, very deep in the bone marrow of the field. And the idea is that what literary scholars and other humanists study is just fundamentally unquantifiable. It is spirit stuff. It is uh, off there in the ether somewhere, and it is not going to be, you're not going to be able to address it in any suitable way with tools from the sciences. Um, because there's just, just this sense of the two subject areas really being two cultures that truly are separated. And there's something about the stuff of the humanities that renders the tools of the sciences impotent. Um, so the, the, the reason they, they sort of, or, or, there's a lot of hunting and pecking around for confirming evidence 
is there's this sense in the field that this is this is the only way to do it. You know, there's there's never an alternative method. So the idea of doing literary science would would sound simply laughable uh, to most people in my field. Uh, they would snicker into the back of their hands at the, the very thought of it because it would seem so miserably scientific, so pathetically science ending, and so ultimately futile. Now, coming from the other direction as you do, you're refuting this idea. How much of a point would you say that they have when they say that literary stuff is unquantifiable? In what situations might they be right? What I, what, what I most would like to see happen is, is the introduction of a, a stronger spirit of empiricism in the field. So I could make a priori statements about things that, that you know might be beyond the reach of scientific method. And I do believe that there are probably some things that for the foreseeable future, maybe forever, will be beyond the reach of scientific methods. But I'd rather people treat this in an empirical sense and question by question start getting in the habit of saying, is this a question that in whole or in part can reduce to numbers? Um, and so one of the, the, the book makes big claims, but then the, the last four uh, chapters or so of the book are devoted to backing those claims up. The, the, the point of those chapters is to show that some literary questions, big literary questions, things with implications that, that reach pretty far, um, can be addressed using proper principled scientific methods. Are there certain challenges to quantifying literary studies that have held that field back besides just a, a bias against doing that? Is there I don't a... think so. Oh, really? I, I, I think that... All fields of inquiry, including most fields of scientific inquiry, have questions that are, that are best addressed scientifically uh, through number and questions that, with current methods, are best addressed through qualitative uh, approaches. So in psychology, you know, they, they, whatever they can, they you know, apply numbers, um, but sometimes they can't. And the, the case study, for instance, is a valuable part of psychology and Sociology and anthropology have their quantitative and their qualitative branches. Many fields of inquiry used text data, you know, text-based data that they glean uh, from the text and do statistical treatments on and so forth to address at least some issues or some, some, some dimensions of the questions they ask. I, I, I don't think, you know, you know, a biography of Keats, you know, we don't, you, I don't think you need to know any statistics to do that. I, I do think there will be questions, you know, that are beyond the reach of scientific methods, and that's a good thing, and that's completely in line with other scientific fields, including biology, for instance. You know, where not everything in biology reduces to number. I certainly want to get on to the case studies, the quantitative studies you have in the book, but first I want to make sure we touch on another part of your argument. Of course, we just said that the literary studies cannot afford to ignore the methodology of science, but also it can't afford to ignore the actual discoveries of science. You use a, an image in the book, the tree of knowledge, that the literature is up on the branches and there's some more fundamental stuff at the root. Now, what's going on as far as the humanities acknowledging what's been discovered by science? It, it appears from your book that they're certainly ignoring it to some degree. Yeah, and this is again, a portrait of the last, you know, 30 or 40 years. I think things are starting to change just a little bit. There's been more acknowledgement of the relevance of scientific discovery to our inquiry in the last uh, few years, but still, pr still pretty minor. Um, yeah, so, so you bring up the tree of knowledge. That, that goes back to the theory uh, section of the book. And so we've already talked about the, the weaknesses and attitudes. We've talked about weaknesses and methods. And this is about weakness and theory. The tree of knowledge is this idea coming out of E.O. Uh, e. Wilson, uh, the Harvard biologist and entomologist, um, his idea of consilience. And the idea of consilience is that all knowledge is interconnected. Like in Darwin's tree of life, where everything merges from a central trunk and everything's related, uh, Wilson views all of knowledge in the same way as emerging ultimately from the laws of you know, particle physics, of the trunk of the tree can be seen as physics, and it branches out to branches of chemistry. And the branches of chemistry are constrained by physics. And then biology grows out of chemistry, and the branches of biology are constrained by chemistry. And then you go into the social sciences and psychology, which are constrained by human biology. 
my ultimate claim is that the humanities are in that tree. They're out on the, they're in the greenery, they're the, they're the canopy of the tree. And the practice and products of humanities disciplined, disciplines are, you know, a branch out of, of psychology, of human psychology, uh, which is in turn nested in biology and so on. So the idea is that all knowledge is interconnected. And the problem, theoretically, with the field of literary studies over the last few decades is that we have been off the tree. We've ignored the rest of the tree. So we've gone on with sort of obsolete theories of human nature, uh, hard social constructivist stuff, blank slate stuff, outmoded, obsolete psychological theories that have no existence in psychology anymore, like psychoanalysis, like Lacanian and Freudian psychoanalysis, which simply do not exist in psychology anymore, except in historical overviews. So we have bad theories. We have old, obsolete theories that have been rejected in most other fields of inquiry. We just, we just ignored that fact and gone along, gone along with our work. One of the biggest facets of science, especially of biology, that you mentioned literary studies ignoring in your book is Darwinian evolution and the implications that evolution has for humans and for humanity, for the subject of the humanities, really. But what I was thinking to myself is that Gravity acts on humans, and I don't think any modern literary scholar would would argue to the contrary. They wouldn't say gravity doesn't act on humans. Why is it easier for them to just dismiss that evolution would have an effect, would have some bearing on how humans act? Well, it's a puzzling thing. I mean, the, the last 40 years have seen a true revolution in human understanding. And the, and the, and the revolution has been that humans are critters. Humans are evolved beings, and that evolution didn't just stop at the chin. It's, uh, you know, it affects the brain. The, ev- the brain is a biological organ shaped by natural selection to promote the survival and reproduction of our ancestors. Um, and so the idea is that psychology evolved. And psychology must be understood in an evolutionary context. It doesn't mean that whatever version of evolutionary psychology that is currently ascendant is the correct one. But there's no, there's no alternative for a, for, a, for a literate scientific person to the hypothesis that psychology evolved. Um, going back to about 1975, there's been a real uh, revolution in our understanding of the mind and how the mind works. And sort of puzzlingly, literary scholars have managed not to be touched by it. They've done it in two ways. One is they've dismissed it as a sort of naked return of the grossest excesses of social Darwinism. The idea is that, you know, this is just another hidden ploy to foist racist, sexist, bad, awful attitudes onto people. That sort of critique has faded in recent years. I'm trying to explain in the early years how they have avoided it. But it is puzzling because at bottom, literary studies, like all other human, human, humanities fields, humanities means about humans. Uh, these, are all sort, these are all fields about human nature. And it's, it's, it is puzzling that this, this new advance in the study of human nature hasn't touched the field, hasn't excited the field. This is going to sound like a joke, but it's a serious question. Do, do humanities scholars then not really want to know about humans? Because you'd think if they did, they would want any human-related information they could have. That doesn't sound like a joke to me. That's, 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 that's an interesting way of putting it. And to me, basically, at, the, at, at bottom, it's, it's mysterious. Here's, here's what I think might be happening. I think it is going to change. I think it is changing. Uh, as we speak, it is changing. Uh, my books are getting published. You know, um, there is some interest in this, and, 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 and there's interest in the broader media. So I, I do think this is going to change. I think it's kind of inevitable. But the reason it's been slow is, again, you have to remember that the field over the last few decades has been about one thing above all, and that is the idea of doing politics through scholarship. And so... When in, the 1970, in 1975, 1976, when E.O. Wilson's book Sociobiology came out, and the Harvard study group of Science for the People, which is a Marxist organization, came out with this blistering, scathing indictment 
and students, you know, would go and protest his uh, E.O. Wilson's talks, dump pitchers of water on his head, say, racist Wilson, you can't hide, we charge you with genocide. Stephen Jay Gould, Richard Lewinton, a lot of really smart people, uh, E.O. Wilson's colleagues, really branded the field as ideologically toxic, as real, as real poison. And most people in the field that I, most people in my field that I talk to about, about these ideas, many of them are still armed with those early critiques of sociobiology that came out of, you know, uh, Stephen Jay Gould and, and Richard Lewinton. So I think that probably has something to do with it. But how effectively is politics done from an academic position? I mean, I, I'm not saying it is or it isn't, but when, over this span of time that professors have tried to make political strides via, I, I'm not going to say the ivory tower, that's a little bit, uh, that's, that's not what I'm going for, but via their academic positions, how, how well does that, has that worked? Well, I think you're right to, to say the ivory, t- ivory tower. Um, and I think you're, you're right to suspect that it hasn't worked very well. There would be a lot of argument about this um, and hot argument. But I'm of the position that it is not only made for bad scholarship, it is made for bad politics. So the idea that scholarship can be a, an, a, an activist vehicle has tainted the scholarship. People don't trust the scholarship because they know that you know it, it serves as a vehicle for uh, the, the, whatever political struggle the uh, the writer is interested in, um, and it also makes it also you know makes for bad politics. The idea that you can write you know a Marxist uh, critique of you know a Balzac novel uh, and that's going to shake the foundations of world capitalism, you know obviously that's not true. Um, obviously this is a this is a you know a, a fairly weak form of activism. And, you know, it just, it just, I mean, it, other scholars have said this, I, um, that the, the, the problem with it, too, is, is it, it is, if you become just an activist, I mean, look at the media around you. What, what you tend to see is, is no literary scholars on Terry Gross's Fresh Air or on the Jim, uh, the Lair Report, you know, on PBS or whatever, or on the Daily Show. Literary scholars have wanted to be political activists, and they've had very little political impact. Whereas if you look at all those shows, all those media outlets, you'll see a lot of scientists. And it's partly because scientists deal with big, momentous issues like global climate change and so forth. Uh, But it's also partly because people trust science. Um, And it's not just out of a naive, romantic sense of what a scientist is. It's a feeling that scientists have done everything in their power, have almost heroically striven to get things right, even if they're often wrong. Uh, and that we've done, you know, exactly the opposite. Uh, we haven't we haven't tried hard to get things right. There does seem to be a certain amount of confidence in the fact as well that if one scientist gets something wrong, uh, probably another scientist, more like a thousand of them, will rise up to shoot down a scientist who's who's doing something incorrect as far as searching for the truth. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So science is science ends up being you know this magnificent, incredible, uh, self-corrective process where at the end of the century you do get it, you really do get a, a pile of new knowledge that is likely more true than what you had at the beginning of the of the last century none of that knowledge is you know perfect all of it is subject to to falsification and discom- disconfirmation um, but you know there's, there's no secret nothing mysterious to the reason the science has been so successful and and again the critique of my book is it is also no secret to why literary studies and other humanities fields have been unsuccessful in accumulating knowledge and why we are having a lot of problems in the field, you know, with low prestige, plunging morale, uh, low enrollments. You know, these disciplines are really in trouble. Um, And there's no secret to why that is. We, We haven't been doing a good job. There's a phrase that you use in the book, you quote from, I believe, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, that uh, on, on a subject that you consider him to be more right about, that we should bring up the idea of science being a reduction of the probability space of possible explanations for, for phenomena. Now, is there anything to, we just talked about students, academics pouring water on Edward O. Wilson's head for publishing sociobiology. Is there anything to the idea that constricting possibility space 
of explanations for phenomena will release some kind of Pandora's box in the human world will lead to uh, maltreatment of other people. True scientific fact, mind you, is what I'm talking about. Is there any downside that we've seen to the discovery of actual knowledge, reliable knowledge? Well, sure. I mean, sure, it's a double-edged sword of science. Knowledge is, knowledge is dangerous. I mean, that, that was part of the, re- the reason for the whole sociobiology argument. The, the argument, the, 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 I mean, the critique of sociobiology, part of the worry was, it was a real worry, that what if scientists start studying things like gender differences and find out that gender differences are real? That really men and women are uh, statistically distinguishable in their emotional traits or personality traits. Um, and so on and so forth. And will that lead people then to say, okay, women, uh, you're different than men, therefore, you know, get back in the kitchen, and et cetera. That there would be political and social uh, fallout from these ideas. That, that, that really didn't uh, develop uh, in sociobiology. But, yeah, I mean, you can you cite all kinds of things where uh, expansion of scientific knowledge uh, leads to things like hydrogen bombs, you know, this, uh, you know, this incredibly perverse uh, killing weapon. However, I would argue... Um, and and the, the, idea of, the idea of possibility space, I should explain that metaphor. That's not, that's not Gould, that's mine. Oh, okay. um, the, the, uh, the idea is that the scientific process can be viewed as this gradual shrinking down of the space of possible explanation for given questions. So you never get uh, absolute certainty, but for some things, like tectonic uh, shift or evolution or the theory of, uh, I don't know, uh, the circulation of the blood. You know, you can narrow the probabilities down so far that it's vanishingly unlikely that the idea is, is wrong. If you're just tuning in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas from Colin Marshall Radio. At our website, colinmarshallradio.com, you'll find our complete interview archive, all downloadable as podcasts, plus other shows and more. My guest is Jonathan Gottschall, English instructor at Washington and Jefferson College, author of Literature, Science, and a New Humanities. Now, the Gould quote was the one I just remembered where he said the, the evidence that it was science was the method of uh, piling up the evidence to where it would be perverse to deny it. Something like yeah. that, right? He's defining science, Gould is. And he says that the definition of a science fact, scientific fact, is that there's so much evidence accumulated that it will be, quote, perverse to withhold provisional consent. Okay, so it's a quite sophisticated definition of scientific fact that I like quite a lot. That provisional is certainly, that, that's the key right there. Yeah, yeah. This brings to mind this, what we've recently been talking about, a, a paper that you've probably seen. It's really more of an article that has been passed around the Internet a lot since it was written in, I believe, the early 90s. But it's by a fellow named Chip Morningstar called How to Deconstruct Almost Anything, the story of this electrical engineer who goes to a conference about cyberspace, whatever they were talking about it in, in those days. And he encountered for the first time the world of deconstruction, the world of post-structuralism, the world of postmodernism. He tried very hard to figure out what exactly made it tick, because he did find it fascinating in terms of an object of study. And he said, he said a line that I've, it's always stuck with me. He said, I'm not sure whether their use, their, their interpretation of Marx as the correct model for economics and Freud as the correct model for psychology is merely a convention or that they actually believe it. Now, am I to understand from what you're saying they're actually believed? That's really interesting. And again, I, 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 I always imagine like the audience for an interview like this, and there'd be some you know literary scholar sitting there, and I'm trying to read their minds, and they probably are kind of unhappy with me. <laughs> but I wonder about that uh, if they believe it or not. My feel, I, I had you know I have a friend uh, here at at my college who I won't you know name, but you know we have, we argue about these things. He's he's a literary scholar too. You know one night over beers at a bar, uh, we were talking and arguing about these things as we usually do, and I was basically able to get him to admit that there was no reason to believe that psychoanalysis had any sort of empirical validity, and neither did Marxism, or, you know, sort of the classical, uh, many, many of the classical Marxist uh, sorts of ideas. I sort of was able to corner him and get him, get him to admit it, and he said, well, um, okay, okay, I'll, 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 you know, I'll, say that, 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 that those things are probably not true, but I'm still going to use them in my classes. I'm like, why? I, I couldn't believe it. Um, why, would you, why would you do that? And he said, well, I'm going to 
quote him correctly. Um, he said, well, they might not be right, but they, they're still illuminating. They bring out pattern. That was the quote. They bring out pattern. And so for my friend, uh, the whole point, we have, a, we have a, a, a different philosophy of what the field is for. His idea is that you study the humanities, you study literature um, to exercise the mind, uh, to find beauty, to find those, those patterns and argue about them um, and so on. Where I have a different idea, that the, the idea is to get closer approximations to the truth about what we study. Along the way, of course, you know, delighting in the beauty of the artifacts. So the, your question is, do they actually believe it? I think in many cases, if you pin them down, no. I don't think, I don't, I don't think that, that many of them would believe it. The idea that, for instance, men and women are at birth genetically indistinguishable gender-wise in terms of what's, what, what sort of psychology they're likely to develop, what sort of personality traits they're likely to develop. No one really believes that in their heart, I don't think. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of them say it uh, in their papers and dissertations. I guess this comes back to a, the, a very basic thing we discussed earlier is that, and I don't know whether you'll agree with this or not, but I guess some people in the field care about what's true and false objectively and some simply find it irrelevant. Is that the basic divide? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I really am not sure. The, the basic divide... You know, I, I just don't know. I don't know, what the, I, don't, I don't know what the basic divide would be. I think that there are... I think, I think, you know, the, the field of literary studies right now is a really brutal place. Um, it is brutal because the field is contracting in terms of its resources, uh, funding, and so forth. And at the same time, graduate schools are still factories churning out professors who have no place to go. And so one of the distinctions between the sciences and the, and the academic humanities right now, especially in, in a field like literary studies, is that in, science, in the sciences... Young scholars can afford to be bold. I mean, in, in the sciences, if you, you know, go attack, if you're a youngster and you go attack an icon in the field, you know, there's, there's probably a price to pay. It's dangerous to do. But in the end, the icon is going to have to seed the field, you know, if your data is better. Uh, and the humanities is, is not really the same way. And since and you have this, a system set up where there's so many people applying for so few jobs, there's really strong pressure on people to pay lip service to the gurus and grandees in the field. And so I think, it's, I think one of the reasons for the, the, the field not making progress, and by the way, my critique is in many ways quite tame. The other people are saying the same thing, that, that, that things are bad in the field, that we're not doing things well is sort of a truism. They might, other people would argue that there's you know, different reasons, different root causes for this. But the idea that things are sort of in need of serious reformation and change is, is one that you, you hear very frequently in the upper echelons of power. I certainly want to come back to the experience of the aspiring professor of literary studies, but first I'd like to touch on a few of the case studies in your book, a few of the quantitative studies you provide, because they're some of the most inter interesting material here. And it, they shine the way forward, you might say, as far as what can be done quantitatively. Now, if you're studying, for example, this is pulled straight from the book, uh, the trends of how female protagonists are portrayed in folktales, how do you go about making a quantitative study out of such a question? Well, th this study, we, we, we call this chapter The Heroine with a Thousand Faces. And this work was inspired by Joseph Campbell's book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and other books, a big research program in literary studies and psychology and other fields, folk, folk tale studies, um, to define what are qualities that heroes tend to, to share across cultural and historical borders. And the idea was that if you found, you went to Ghana and, you know, uh, European countries and northern Pacific uh, Indians, and you went to New Guinea and the Amazon Basin, if you find that all the heroes are the same, one, you, the, 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 it has to be one of two explanations. One is it's coming from a source myth, um, which is vanishingly improbable. Uh, most, uh, the idea really has no life anymore in, in folktale studies. Or two, 
it reflects common properties in the human mind. So people are people are people everywhere, and they gravitate towards the same sort of stories and the same sort of heroes. But no, no work in that vein had been done for for female characters, and so the, the several of the chapters in that book of the case studies deal with cross-cultural gender traits in, in female characters. Um, we also gather data about male characters, but mainly just to measure the qualities of the females. And so in that chapter, The Heroine with a Thousand Faces, we're able to sort of draw a, a composite portrait of what you know heroines are like across cultures. And in later chapters, um, we develop the basic findings of that chapter. When you're doing, when you're going about quantifying the things you'll, the elements of the folk tales you need to study, right? What are the challenges of that? There are challenges. This is not easy. In all, but that, but but again, that is not different than other scientific fields. In all scientific fields, coming up with the question is easy. Coming up with the method for solving the problem, that's where all the ingenuity happens. That's where, you know, the, the real hard work comes. So, Yes, there are problems taking text and converting some aspects of that text, at least, to data. But what, what we did um, in the heroin study, well, for instance, we had 15 coders, uh, people who read, read the text. These are uh, undergraduates at St. Lawrence University, where I used to teach. Um, and they were all naive. In this, and that, what that means is that I, on purpose, did not choose, you know, scholarly, knowledgeable uh, readers who have their, their biases and, and so forth. These, these readers were naive as to the hypothesis that we were you know, uh, studying or, or looking to test. And they go through and read the text, text and answer very simple questions about them. Um, you know, how old does the character appear to be? Is, is, is he or she portrayed as attractive or not attractive? How many references? There's a lot of counting. How many references to attractiveness are there in the study? Um, does this character get married or not? Um, what does the character seem to value in a mate? And there's always, and these, and these aspects of the text can be quantified. Um, and you can check the quality of the coding by having all the coders read a certain subset of the tales and make sure that you know, they're, they're, they're basically coming to the same answers to the same questions. And there's also a lot of sort of computerized uh, techniques that we were able to use. Um, counts of gendered pronouns, for instance, ended up being hugely uh, illuminating for us, he versus she, uh, et cetera, uh, counts of references to physical attractiveness. So we'd go through 90 collections of digitized folk tales and have the computer identify any word that could conceivably, in any context, be associated with physical attractiveness. And then humans would go through and say, okay, is that a reference to, to, to a real, you know, to, to a woman's beauty? or a man's beauty, or is a beautiful sunset. Um, and, we, and we would count uh, references to gender attractiveness that way. And, you know, I think that we have very interesting and promising results. But something I've kind of fall all over myself to say in the book is that these are not perfect. We, we almost certainly made some mistakes. I, I hope that, you know, in 10 years these studies look pretty primitive as people get better at, at, at applying some of these methods as, as, the, as the computerized tools for, for looking at digitized text uh, improved by leaps and bounds. So we have promising studies there, but certainly not the last word. What we're trying to do there is just to do proof of concept. And the, and the concept is that some aspects of literature, important aspects, can be quantified. And in the following study you have in the book, testing feminist fairy tale studies, you're actually putting some of the assertions that feminist critiques have made about these stories to the quantitative test. And it seems like it should be not entirely disheartening because some of them are not 100% confirmed quantitatively, but they're certainly not disconfirmed. Yes. One of the, again, this is partially about the specific question of of this specific school that has been very prominent in literary studies, feminist critics of the fairy tale who argue that the fairy tale is sort of a patriarchal indoctrination vehicle, and it's really bad for little girls, you know, really uh, twists twist their you know, vulnerable minds. But the bigger point is that literary scholars all the time are making 
fact claims are making hypotheses, um, and that is one of them. And, it, and, and many times they are testable scientifically. So we're able to take a lot of the specific claims that feminists make about European fairy tales. The argument is, let's say, let's just take one aspect of it. Uh, feminist fairy tale scholars argue that um, there's, there's a lot of emphasis put on women's beauty in Western fairy tales uh, compared to men's beauty. And little girls get the message that, and it's a damaging message, that in order to be valuable, in order to be a heroine in the story, you know, you have to be pretty. You have to be beautiful. And they argue that's a cultural construct. It's just made up. There's no basis in human nature for that. Um, it's, it just comes out of, you know, the, uh, you know the, the certain historical, cultural elements in Western culture. So that, that, that's an easy thing to test. What you do is you go and you look at patterns of beauty or references to beauty in other folk and fairy tale traditions. And that's what we did. We go all around the world, uh, across centuries, across very, very diverse, sort, diverse sorts of cultures, you know, hunter-gatherer tribes, chiefdoms, uh, modern, no, sorry, pre-industrial state societies, and you see if the same patterns pop up. And if the same patterns of, of gender and so forth keep popping up around the world, then it seems uh, quite unlikely that all of these different societies just happen to be culturally conditioning in the exact same way. Um, and if you do find that, if you, say, if you find regularity across cultures in, the, in these variables, then probably it has a basis in shared elements of human psychology. So for the beauty question, we found that the feminists were right about Western culture. There are a lot more references to the female attractiveness and male attractiveness in Western fairy tale collections, about six to one. Uh, yeah, six to one, I think the number is it's in that magnitude. But then if you look all around the world, you find exactly the same pattern. Six references to female attractiveness for every single reference to male. Um, and we're able to check, like, you know, in, in female edited collections versus male edited, edited collections, and the patterns are still there. Um, this does not seem to be a product of cultural conditioning, and we say tentatively that the, apparent, that the, the, the feminist hypothesis seems to be disconfirmed. It seems that when somebody who's used to reading many literary studies papers reads these case studies, at least I imagine, it'll be very refreshing to them to see an argument made without summoning up as evidence the fact that some sage from the discipline's past said something. It's, you know, saying yeah. Foucault said this. There's no oh, evidence yeah. based in that ad hominem way. Yeah, there's, there's real, I mean, again, it, talking to you has sharpened these ideas in my mind, but, you know, it, again, this is just a crippling problem in the field. That's so, that, that, that literary scholarship prides itself on sort of being an avant-garde movement. But there's this crippling reliance on the authority of gurus, on Darwin's and, and Freud's, not Darwin, sorry, I wish it was Darwin, on <laughs> Freud, Lacan, um, Derrida, and so on. That is, is a bit of a scandal. And it used to be, you know, that I would read papers, you know, when, when I was in graduate school especially, in the first paragraph, you know, in the first couple of sentences, Start with, as Jack Derrida said, there's nothing outside the text. And from that premise, the whole argument is based just on what this guy said. And it's been disastrous for the field. The portrait you paint in this book of the way literary studies looks today, it's, it seems massively dysfunctional. Now, if that's the case, what is attracting a bright, young college graduate who wants to go to grad school to this discipline? Why, why, I mean, obviously, it attracted you. Maybe with, you had the idea of doing this very thing, of shaking things up. What, what's attracting many future professors, or if the, if, the, if the news is to be believed, um, future professors that won't actually maybe get tenure? I think uh, they're going in with their eyes closed. I think that most of them come out of their undergraduate institutions having a much more traditional sort of uh, old-fashioned humanistic experience of reading great books and talking about them, and they really just enjoy themselves, and they love literature, and they want to go study it and teach it. And, and their teachers and you know, uh, literature departments are often very uh, articulate and charismatic, and they want to be like them. Um, that was sort of my story. Uh, then they arrive at graduate school and find you know, that they 
are reading a lot more theory than they are literature. You know, that, 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 you know, for instance, in my graduate experience, uh, I was just stunned by how little reading of literature we did and how much reading of, uh, at least in my day, you know, Jacques Derrida and uh, Lacan and um, the, the theoretical gurus. And then, you know, uh, there's people... You know, I, I sound like I'm being mean to people in the profession, but these are, these are mainly good people who really do love reading and thinking about literature, and, and they want to do it for a living. You know, when I, I was in graduate school, at some point, at some point, you just get invested in it. You're, you're, you're deeply enough invested, and in you have so much money sunk in the pot that it's very hard to fold, um, even though you should fold um, by, by the statistics. So, for instance, when I was in graduate school, after I finished my master's, I was going to re-up to do my doctorate, and the director of the program, you know, asked me if I was really sure about doing that. And at that point, you know, I was, I was kind of invested in it, and I knew that things were, were bleak for me. Um, I knew that, you know, I would have to sort of, you know, get lucky, you know, to, to even find any sort of employment. There's several hundred job applications for every, you know, junior, most uh, humble professorship, you know, 200, 300 to 1. Um, and my, and my uh, graduate director said to me, okay, you know, I'll take your, I'll take your, uh, your application, but you're making a mistake. And I really appreciated that. Um, he, he told me, frankly, you know, that the odds are not in your favor uh, in the long run. And I, d I don't think that that gets across early enough to most people when they're entering a, a graduate program in literary studies. I, think, I don't think they quite understand how, how bleak things are on the job market. And there's just also this kind of you know, self-serving hope that, well, you know, I'll, I'll be the one who beats the odds. At what point did you find that this angle of improving the methods, improving the attitude, improving the theory of literary studies was something you would be interested in doing as far as bringing in techniques and attitudes from the, the sciences? Uh, when I was a graduate student, I, I came to this uh, pretty early on. The whole idea grew slowly, but you know, I was, I was very interested in, in evolutionary psychology. It was in the early, well, mid-90s, and evolutionary psychology was really taking off and becoming a, a public phenomenon. And I read some of the early popular, popularizations of evolutionary psychology, and then I went back to the primary literature and got really, really excited about that stuff and uh, immediately knew that I wanted to do a dissertation that would, that would bring that, those ideas into play. And I understood that these were revolutionary in the context of um, the ideas that I was dealing with. So I went and wrote a dissertation um, on Homer from an evolutionary point of view that was made into a book this last year, 2008, called uh, The Rape of Troy, Evolution, Violence, in the World of Homer. And it's important to say that I recognize, and so we've been talking about you know, my, 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 my statistical, scientific uh, work, but that is a... That is a work of old-fashioned historicist scholarship that also brings in a heavy dose of evolutionary theory and findings from the fields of evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology. Well, the method I use in that book is you know, old-fashioned, careful reasoning and close reading. And the reason is, the reason I did it that way is I could think of no way to bring that book within the quantitative sphere. sphere. And I think that there are questions that, that really will resist, but we can still address things in a more scientific spirit. So I did try, you know, attitudinally, I try not to bring any of my, you know, personal political beliefs to the project. And theoretically, I use the most sort of scientifically respectable ideas about the evolution of the mind that are available. Now, we're coming up on the end of the hour, but I wanted to get in one more thing, and that's how much opposition now in the late 2000s do you actually face? How much discouragement in trying to bring in outside ways of thinking and out discoveries from outside ways of thinking as well? Is how much of a wall is there still? I think there's a big wall. I think that for people outside of our field, what I say makes a lot of sense. So it seems to be like... like what I have said makes some sense to you. And I think in a, in a larger media, you know, so for, for instance, I've, so I've sort of, you know, I've been asked to write things for the Boston Globe and, you know, sort of major media outlets have had some interest in me. So there's some broader public interest. Uh, however, you know, like I, when I write that book, that, that article from the Boston Globe, 
there's a raging, you know, blogospheric response to it of people who don't like my idea at all and uh, don't like me very much either, you know. So it's and they're mainly people from with, from within the field. So yeah, I'm I'm saying in the book that I that you're doing every. Here's what I'm saying to my colleagues: you are doing everything wrong, and you should be more like me. And of course, there's going to be a lot of resistance um, to that, and I'm embarrassed that that's what my argument comes down to. You know, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm I'm kind of a, at least a somewhat humble person, and you know, that makes me uncomfortable making that sort of making that sort of uh, case. But that's that is what the case is, and and I do think in the end, after a lot of struggle, that something like my ideas will take hold. But there's a saying about scientific progress it's called Planck's principle. And it goes like this, scientific progress, death by death. And the idea is that, you know, even though scientific science does change, you know, part of a scientific, you know, revolution means the old guy is dying off. And so I do think this, this might be a generational change. It might take a while for the ideas that I'm talking about to trickle down. The name of the book, once again, is Literature, Science, and a New Humanities. Jonathan Gottschall, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the program. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas from Colin Marshall Radio. Visit us at colinmarshallradio.com to find our complete interview archive, other shows, podcasts, and more. Our music is produced by Ben Althaus. Hear more of his work at benalthaus.com. 